Hello, City Life leaders. It is good, good, good to be with you. Um, now, I have to be honest, and part of me is sad, and the part of me that's sad is because I would love to be with you in person as we plant. But since we don't get to, I am thrilled. I am just thrilled that for just a few minutes I get to be with you via this video, and uh, part of it is because you get it. Um, I know your church. I've been to your church. I, I love Kim Hammond and his family and Pastor Andrew. Um, so I, I'm very familiar with your church. You get small groups. You get the importance of, of leadership development. You understand reproduction and the priority of mission. You get those things. So for me, it's a thrill to talk to you about our topic today. It's a, it's a book I got to write along with Warren Bird called Hero Maker. And part of the reason I'm so excited is because I think your church and your leadership, you are ready for something just like this. Because as you hear this, I think what you're going to realize is we have everything we need right here through City Life to catalyze a movement. To catalyze a movement just like Jesus dreamed. All right? So I just want to talk to you about uh, how you can become a hero-making leader. Let me start with this. Um, I was in a meeting with a guy named Millard Fuller. Millard was the guy who was the founder of Habitat for Humanity. And his office was in uh, the southern part of the United States, America's Georgia. And I took two buddies with me that were real estate developers. And our hope, our hope was maybe we could spend 30 minutes with this guy just to pick his brain and all he'd accomplished through Habitat for Humanity. Now, <clears throat> what turned out is we spent most of the day with him. He was super gracious. He actually put us in his car and took us around and showed us different Habitat for Humanity homes. Then he actually took us out to lunch, fielded all of our questions. After lunch, they brought us back to his office, and we sat down and talked some more. And I'll never forget this moment. He looked at me across his desk, right in the eye, and he said, Dave, don't you think everyone deserves a simple, decent place to live? Don't you think everyone deserves a simple, decent place to live? And, and there... He said there was such conviction, this vision was such passion. There was no disputing the truth. That every person deserved to have a roof over their head and deserved to have shelter. That no person should ever go homeless. And I could feel the adrenaline kind of rushing through my body. He was such a compelling visionary. But at the same time, I had no idea. How could you do that? How can you make sure that everyone, and when he said everyone, he meant everyone. Everyone had a simple, decent place to live. And then he began to explain his strategy. He said, my strategy was this. I knew that with that kind of a vision, I couldn't do something on my own. I couldn't just become a carpenter. That would never accomplish the vision. And he said, I also knew I simply couldn't start a construction company. That wouldn't accomplish the vision. And he even pointed to my two buddies who are real estate developers. He said, I know they do big things. and You guys do big things a lot. But I, I couldn't just become a real estate developer. That would never accomplish the vision of every person having a simple, decent place to live. And then he said, what I had to do is I had to find a way to mobilize every follower of Jesus to volunteer to swing a hammer and to help build homes for homeless people. And that's exactly what he did. And guess what? Guess who is one of the biggest home builders, for profit or not for profit, biggest home builders in the entire world today? Habitat for Humanity. They've now helped build over 22 million homes for families around the world to give them a simple, decent place to live. <laughs> I remember too, and, and Miller added, Millard added this to He said, and we also build the best homes. I was like, how do you build the best homes? You've got volunteers. He said, oh, because we use three times as many nails as anybody else. <laughs> All right, so how did this happen? How did this movement take place? How was, what allowed Habitat for Humanity to become a movement? And, and what are the leaders people like you and I do to create a movement where every person has a simple, decent place to live. Well, I want to use that as an example. And, and, and here's what I think we understand. I'm going to give you two things. First, they became what I call a level five organization, a level five organization. I'll explain that. And then secondly, the leaders in that organization decided they were not going to be the heroes, but instead they were going to become hero makers. They weren't going to be the heroes, but they were going to become hero makers. All right, let me explain this level five organization. Um, <clears throat> I have the privilege of being the president of the Exponential Conference, and we have the largest church planning conference in the U.S. 
<clears throat> we've recently been able to go to Europe and we're really excited about the strong possibility of coming to Australia so we can bring together great church planning organizations like New Thing that we're a part of. And, uh, but through Exponential, we're able to do some research on the organizational capacity of churches. Now stick with me on this. And what we discovered is that churches can be basically grouped into, into five different groups or five different levels. Now, level one churches are churches in decline. They have less people on mission this year than last year. And they're kind of going that direction on the graph. That's a level one church. And about 35% of all churches in the U.S., and you'll have to figure it out for your context, but in the U.S. are level one churches in decline. Then there are level two churches. Level two churches are churches that are plateauing. They added a few people, lost a few people. It's kind of a static, kind of steady state. About the same number of people on mission this year as last year. That's level two churches. And again, in the U.S., I don't know what it is in Australia, but in the U.S., about 35%. Then you get to level three churches. Level three churches are those churches that are growing. It's starting to, to turn up, you know, kind of up a little bit, the graph. And those are churches that have more people on mission this year, who said yes to following Jesus and are on mission this year than last year. And in the U.S., about 30% of all churches would be that level three growing churches. Now, then you get to this Special two categories that we're really interested in, level four and level five churches. Level four churches are reproducing churches. Now, of those 100% in level one, two, and three, some of them are also in this level four, level five category. Now, the number in level four in the U.S., we've recently climbed now to 7% of all churches in the U.S. are reproducing. When I say reproducing, that means they ever planted a brand new site or started a brand new church. They're just starting this reproducing. And we would love to see that number get to 10%, 17%, kind of a tipping point. And that we think that could change the spiritual landscape of the U.S. But then you get to level five churches. If four are reproducing, level five are multiplying churches. Those churches that are continually multiplying over and over and over again. First generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, and beyond. And in the U.S. right now, there's only just a handful of those that are actually multiplying churches. Now, here's the problem. <clears throat> Okay, and City Life, be aware of this. Most churches think the sole goal is just to get to level three, to get to growing. But the problem is you can grow, but if you're not reproducing or multiplying, you will never get to movement. You gotta be thinking about movement. <clears throat> and it's only level four and then level five churches that actually get to movement. So we took this body of knowledge that we now had of, of the level four, level five churches, and we put together a think tank and we assembled them together twice in, in the city of Atlanta. And we began to ask the question specifically about the leadership of these level four and level five churches. What was unique about the leadership of these level four and level five churches? And when we said leader, we didn't mean just the senior pastor or even just the lead team. We meant <clears throat> um, leaders at every level, uh, small group leaders, student ministry leaders, children's ministry leaders, and staff and senior level leaders, volunteer and paid. And so we began to look at the leaders at these level four, level five, reproducing, multiplying churches. And we made a long list of all the traits, of all the characteristics of the leaders in those churches. And I remember we got to about 20, maybe 25 different characteristics or traits. And we stepped back and looked at this white sheet with all these uh, characteristics on it. And I remember somebody spoke up and said, you know what's different about the leaders in these churches? These level four and level five churches? It's kind of like... They're not trying to be the heroes. It's like they're always making heroes of everybody else around them. And then somebody else, and it wasn't me, even though you know I got a chance to write the book, someone else coined the phrase and said, yeah, those leaders are hero makers. They're hero makers. And it stuck. Well, then we backed up and began to look at the life and leadership of Jesus. Now, Jesus is someone who also challenged us to create a movement, right? If we look at Acts 1.8, that's exactly what he's saying. He said, my spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And no matter how you slice that, whether you do it geographically or culturally or socioeconomically, Jesus is talking about a movement, a movement of disciples that would take his message of love and redemption to the whole world. Well, then how did he do it? If that was his vision, how did he do it? One place I want to go, because we'll have a little bit of time, is John 14, 12. Well, what Jesus does, he gathers together his leaders, and he says this to him. He says, hey, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, 
you're going to do the work that I've been doing. Imagine Jesus saying that to you. Hey, the stuff you've seen me do, it's pretty impressive stuff. You're going to do that. And then he goes and he adds this, and you're going to do even greater things than these. Greater things? Yes. Jesus was saying to his followers, his closest followers, I'm going to train you to reach more people than, than me. I'm going to show you how you can take the gospel to more places than me. I'm going to make sure you're the one, the ones who catalyze this movement that reaches the ends of the world, not me. You're going to be, write the, you're going to be the ones who write the best-selling book, the Bible, not me. In fact, you're going to have a greater impact in your life than I ever did during my three years of ministry. And if we look closely at Jesus' life, I'm telling you, go back to the Gospels. His leadership style was to be a hero maker. Now, occasionally people will push back and say, hold on, hold on, hold on, but isn't Jesus our hero? Yes, he is. He is our hero. He, he stretched out his arms and he died on the cross. But we talk about his leadership, and that's what we're talking today, leadership. His leadership style was to be a hero maker. All right, let me, let me get even more, bring some more clarities. What does it look like to be a hero maker? What are some contemporary examples, maybe? Um, let me give you a couple. One is a guy named Bob Buford. Bob was, uh, was a mentor of mine, a guy who made a ton of money in the cable TV business. And um, uh, for him, the, the point of change was really when his only son uh, tragically died at a very young age. And when that happened, um, a lot of things changed for Bob. He wrote a book called Halftime. And if you're a business leader, I'd recommend it, that you check it out. And he said his, that was his halftime. And he, because it was halftime, he went from success to what he called significance. He went from pursuing things that would make him look successful and be successful to really a life of significance. I think another way you could frame it is Bob went from trying to be the hero to being a hero maker. Bob has a saying that I've adopted as my own and something I think every hero maker ought to adopt as their own. I'd encourage you to do that. He says this, my fruit grows on other people's trees. Don't you love that? My fruit grows on other people's trees. And so when Bob made this shift, he began to change his practices. He actually, he started an organization called Halftime. And it was an organization that would platform successful business leaders and help them make that shift from success to significance. And he, and he was able to help tens of thousands of business leaders. He also started another organization called Leadership Network. And Leadership Network would be a platform for church leaders, innovative church leaders, to share what they'd learned. But it would be a platform. And, and every time I was on the board of Halftime and Leadership Network, and Bob would always say this, hey, we're the platform, we're not the show. We're the platform, we're not the show. Another practice that he had personally is he would carry a three by five card in it, either in his front pocket or maybe in his wallet, in his back. And on that three by five card, he'd have the names of 10, 11, 12 emerging leaders that he was investing in both relationally and financially. You see, Bob made that shift. He went from trying to be the hero to being a hero maker. Let me give you another example. Shalane Flanagan. If that name doesn't mean anything to you, I'm not surprised. Um, I love running. I have three kids who are competitive runners, and um, she is one of the great female distance runners in the United States. Google her and learn a little about her, but let me tell you a little about her story. Uh, Shalane Flanagan won the New York City Marathon in 2017. Now, that was a very big deal in the U.S. because that was the first time in 40 years that a female American had won the New York City Marathon. She won it. The New York Times wrote an article about her. I want to read you a little bit about her from the New York Times, and I think it will enlighten you to what it looks like to be a hero maker. A little different angle here. It says, when Shalane Flanagan won the New York City Marathon last week, her victory was about more than just athletic achievement. Of course, it's a remarkable one. She's the first American woman to win in 40 years, and she did so in a blistering time of two hours and 26 minutes. If any of you are runners and have ever run a marathon I did last year, that is fast. That is fast. Goes on and says, but perhaps Flanagan's bigger accomplishment lies in how she nurtures and promotes the rising talent around her. A rare quality in the cutthroat world of elite sports. Now check this next part out. Every single one of her training partners, all 11 women total in Team Nike, they have made it to the Olympics while training with her. An extraordinary feat. They call it the Shalane Effect. Is that awesome? The Shalane Effect. It's like she pursues greatness, but anybody who gets close to her 
She also makes sure they're great. All 11 women who were trained with her, they also made the Olympics. It goes on to this. She serves as a rocket booster for the careers of the women who work alongside her while catapulting forward herself. Listen to this last part and think about this, even as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a church leader. She has pioneered a brand of team mom to those young and up and comers with the confidence not to tear others down or to try to protect her place in the hierarchy. Oh man, I see a lot of that in the church, trying to protect our place in the hierarchy. That's when you're trying to be the hero. But instead, what we do, no, we nurture the young and up and comers. That's being a hero maker. So that was 2017. 2018, guess what? The Boston Marathon, the next year, no female American had won that in 33 years. Guess what Shalane Flanagan does? Guess. If you guess she won it, you're wrong, okay? Because <laughs> you're thinking heroic. Here's what she does. It's even better than that. She goes to Des Linden. Des Linden is another female American who'd come up second, who'd come so close in so many majors, but never won the big one. She goes to Des Linden in 2018 and says, listen, this time it's your turn. This time it's your turn. She runs the, the, the Boston Marathon with her. And Des Linden, she wins, becoming the first female in America. Shalane's a, a hero maker for her. Let me continue the story. I'm kind of excited about this. In 2020, we had the Olympic uh, marathon qualifiers. We're supposed to anyway. Guess how many women qualified for the marathon time trials in 2020? Five times as many as typically do. Five times as many as typically do. How did that happen? Many of them credit Shalane Flanagan for inspiring her. And see, here's, that's what a hero maker does. Yes, you're pursuing great things, but you make sure you bring everybody else with you. You want to make everyone around you great. See, that's what a hero making kind of leader is. And I want you to think about this as a small group leader, as a ministry team leader. Okay? Yeah, you create a platform, but you ask other people to stand on it. You say, my fruit grows on other people's trees. And you nurture and develop the rising talent around you. That's what a hero maker does. Let me conclude with one more story. I remember um, I was uh, actually upstairs in this building and uh, uh, I had an appointment with a guy named Sam Stevens, and I saw it on my schedule, and I'm going, who's Sam Stevens? Who's Sam Stevens? So I asked my assistant, Pat, I said, Pat, I had this appointment with Sam Stevens, who is this? And she said, I don't know, I thought you knew. All I know is it's a guy from India. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know? You're my assistant, you're managing my schedule, you're supposed to be in charge of that. She said, I don't know, but what I do know is he's upstairs in the cafe, and you need to go talk to him. <laughs> so I thought, all right. So I had no idea what I was in for, so I put on my, Pastor Happy Face, <clears throat> went to the cafe, stuck on my hand to Sam. Hey, Sam, how you doing? He shook my hand. I said, tell me your story. And he starts telling me his story. He said, um, kind of starts back in the 19, early 60s. Uh, my father started a mission to plant churches. And he was doing it in India. And he said, by 1992, uh, they had planted a little over 200 churches. I was like, wow, you planted 200, over 200 churches? I mean, now, I mean, I was glad for the appointment. The guy had my attention. And Sam's this super humble guy. I'm gonna have to drag every detail out of him. And he goes on to explain, he says, well, yeah, then well, things kind of changed in the, in the early 90s there. He said, and actually, um, that's when my father died. And he told me the story. He said, we were uh, together at my dad's house, and my mom and dad's house, and we stayed up late in the night. My mom had gone to bed. We're talking, having a good time. And the last thing my dad said to me, Sam told me this, was, son, don't lose the vision. Son, don't lose the vision. I left the house, went home to my home. He went to bed. My dad became violently ill in the middle of the night. They had to rush him to the hospital. He went into a coma and uh, he never came out of it and he passed away. And so the last thing he told me, Sam said, was, son, don't lose the vision. So I took over this ministry planting churches, but that's when we made some changes. He said, the one thing, most significant thing that we changed was this. He said, I ask every one of our church planters to not only lead that church that you planted that year, but in addition, I want you to bring at least one person alongside you and you train them during that year and release them at the end of the year to go plant another church. And so every year you would lead your church, but you would also train someone else 
who was going to plant a church, and they, year, they would go plant a church. And so every year it was leading and training and then releasing to plant a church, leading and training someone else and then releasing them to plant a church. And so now I'm really fascinated. I said, well, how's it going? And he said, well, it's pr pretty good. I said, well, like, how good? And he said, well, so far we've planted about 70,000 churches. <laughs> I'm glad I was sitting down. I mean, this is incredible. And, and, and I, I, I said, well, oh, how many people is that? He said, uh, about three and a half million people. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I think he must have misunderstood, like I wasn't impressed, because then he goes, oh, but we, our goal is we're going to plant 100,000 churches and reach 5 million people. I got a chance to um, uh, endorse uh, Sam's book that he released last year. And in our conversation, he, he told me, he said, hey, Dave, I just wanted you to know, we've now planted more than 100,000 churches. How does that happen? How does that happen? It happens when you have a group of leaders who aren't trying to be the hero, but they're making heroes of others. Because they would lead their church and then every year they would train someone else, invest in them to release them to go start a church, to release them and to want them to do even greater things, just like Jesus did, just like Jesus did. I'm telling you, City Life Church, hear me on this, okay? The church was created for movement. In the nomenclature I gave you, we were designed to be a level four, level five, kind of reproducing the multiplying church. You have everything you need to do it. But it starts, it starts with leaders who are going, you know what? It's not about me being the hero. It's about me being a hero maker.